I just want to welcome you today to our April um, scholarly communications webinar series. And today we'll be talking about scholar scholarly publishing and finding the right journal. And I am Ashley Zeidler. I'm the scholarly communications librarian here at MCW Libraries. Um, so if you ever have questions about publishing in general, research metrics, um, anything like that, always feel free to reach out and we can connect. So first off, um, asking yourself the question, where do I wanna publish? Well, there are a few things you want to consider when you're trying to make that decision. A couple things to think about in the beginning would be um, your audience. So aiming to research the intended audience of your work. Um, if you're not publishing in an appropriate journal, it won't reach the audience you meant to. It might not receive the downloads or citations that you might have gotten if it appeared in a better matching journal. But of course, you always wanna talk with your supervisors, your colleagues, see where they're publishing um, within your field. They might have some really great suggestions for you um, on where to publish that maybe you didn't think of before. And then you wanna make a list. So I always say, don't aim too low. Think of your dream journal. Where do you really wanna publish? Where do you, um, want to you know, set your sights, aim high. Start there, make a list of journal titles that are within your field. Some might be a stretch, some not. And then go through this list here and try to make that decision. So if you look at the aims and the scopes of the jour journal, um, make sure that those fit within your research um, type. Uh, what, what research are you doing? What type of article are you writing? That is something to really consider because there are journals that will only accept certain types of art, um, articles. So I had someone that was publishing a systematic review and they wanted to publish in Brain. Well, Brain doesn't accept those. So they had to move on from that choice and think of other places that they could publish. If you're writing a case report, a case series, that's something else that you just want to make sure that that journal is including those publication types. Think of your readership. Is it academic versus practice? Um, subscription versus open access. That is a big one right now. I will go over open access publishing um, today. Speed of, public, speed of publication. Um, how long it takes for that journal to publish your article on average. Um, some of the tools I'll show you today will uh, let you know that information. Maybe you're concerned about the peer review process. Is it single blind, double, is it open? Um, and also journal metrics. I know that is huge for researchers and researchers specifically at MCW. So I'll go over that as well. And you really also, something just to note at the beginning, you don't want to submit your article to more than one journal at a time. So pick one and stick with that. Otherwise, if you need to switch, you need to pull your submission before you submit it elsewhere. And then another tip would be to check the references you're using in your article. See where um, those references published um, their articles. That might direct you to the right journals. And once you have this list made, go over these um, different questions and I think you'll find the right fit after you answer these. But starting off, so journal selection, maybe you don't even know what journal you wanna start publishing in. Well, we do have tools out there that can help you do this. So journal matching tools that are available First would be um, Elsevier Journal Finder. So this is going to match on title, abstract, and keywords for journals that are within Scopus. And you can see here some of the information you have right away when you do this search. You'll see the acceptance rate, the time to publication. You can see their impact factor. So all of that is really important information that you have readily available. 
You'll also see on this one that these, both of these are hybrid journals. So there are open access options and then traditional um, publishing options as well. Then we have a similar tool. So this is called Jane. So journal author name estimator. This does essentially the same thing. It's going to match on title and abstract if you have it to journals um, that are within PubMed or Medline. And then also the DOAJ, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals. And I wanna throw this in here just in case. If you are interested in publishing within an open access journal, the DOAJ is a really great place to get started. It's a database containing over 15,000 peer reviewed open access journals. You get a lot of information through this directory, um, especially those APCs, so the cost to publish. That's very important, I know, to all of our researchers. Um, and what's also great is you get a little bit of information about copyright. Um, I think you'll get information about time to publish as well. So this is a really great resource if you are looking at open access publishing. And before I jump into journal metrics, I wanted to show you these tools. Um, I have a journal article that was published by MCW faculty uh, within the last couple of years, but I wanted to use this as an example so that you can see what it looks like to use these journal matching tools. So if I have my paper title, I'll put that in there. And then I also have an abstract. And I tested this out as well, um, just with keywords instead of an abstract. It does work. It's probably not as successful as it could be, um, but it is nice to just get an idea of maybe you have a general idea of what you're publishing about and you just wanna see what's out there. Um, I'll click find journals. And here you see, starting at the top, a list of journals that we're matching to. And again, like I showed you in that screenshot, you get a lot of information right up front. Um, the impact factor, acceptance rate, I know that is really important. Um, time to publication versus first decision. And then here is that hybrid option for this journal. So because this is a traditional journal, but also has that open access side, if you publish open access, they would charge you about $4,000 to publish in there. If you um, published the traditional route, it would be zero. Just something to keep in mind if you see these um, on the list here. But you can keep scrolling down to see a list of um, suggested journals that you could publish in. And then we also have Jane, very similar, same idea. I'm just going to copy and paste my journal title and abstract, and then click find journals. And again, you'll see that list. It does look very similar. Surgery is the top suggestion. And spoiler, this was published in surgery. <laughs> um, so you can see that it did a good job matching um, this journal title and abstract. You can hover over for confidence. Um, usually it's pretty low, but it does a good job at matching um, your subject area. And then just a little bit about this site. You can hover over these highlighted sections to see that it is um, indexed within Medline. Is it an open access journal? And is it within um, PubMed Central? So those are all little pieces of information that you'll have available through Jane. And then finally, um, I did mention the DOAJ. So I wanted to just show you what that looks like. Um, so the Directory of Open Access Journals. So you just type in a subject for this one and you can scroll through and see a list of journals based on a keyword that you entered. You can use their filters to narrow it down. Um, but really, I just wanted to show what that looked like and the information here that you can see. So you'll see some of these journals actually don't even charge APCs. Um, 
you'll see that the author does retain the copyright, which is also something that is important. I know to researchers, I had a colleague who published uh, a paper in a journal and within it, she included like an infographic that she designed, but when she published, published, she actually had to go to the publisher and request permission to use her own infographic after it had been published. So just things to think about. It is nice to retain that copyright um, yourself as the author. So then let me jump back now to journal metrics. I know I mentioned this um, earlier when you are looking through your list and trying to make that decision. So I'll talk about um, journal impact factor specifically, but journal metrics are really based on citation patterns of their articles. <clears throat> and they can be helpful when you wanna find a publication that will give your research greater visibility. <clears throat> so impact factor specifically, this is going to be through journal citation reports. And at MCW, we do have a subscription to that. So anyone is able to go to JCR um, and browse journals or search journals and find their impact factor and a lot of other really interesting information about their research metrics. But journal impact factor specifically is a calculation based on a two-year period and is calculated by dividing the number of citations in a JCR year by the total number of articles published in those two years. So an impact factor of two means that on average, the articles published in, a in one journal within the one or two years have been or cited two times. So it can get a little confusing, but I tried to um, display that visually for you. So it's the total number of times the journal's articles were cited divided by the total number of citable articles in that journal. <clears throat> and here's a screenshot of what that looks like. So like I said, journal impact factor is through um, technically Web of Science, but it's also called journal citation reports. And I put in a screenshot here of one that you can see and you can see that JAMA surgery where it's ranked. So it's first out of 213 journals within the surgery category. You can see obviously what quartile it's in and you can see uh, all that information going back um, as long as it's been within the JCR. And then something else I just wanted to point out that is a good way to possibly browse for possible you know, journals that you might want to publish in. So within JCR, you can actually search or browse by category. So there are 254 journal categories um, within the JCR. And what's great is you can limit by category and then browse by journal impact factor. You'll see here I have it um, going from quartile one and it would go all the way down to quartile four. But if you are interested in publishing in Q1 or maybe Q1 and two, this is a great way to um, limit that and browse by a certain category and see what is available to you within those quartiles. Some people might not have access to JCR or maybe they are looking to not use um, that impact factor. There is another option out there, it's Simago, and that is a journal rankings um, uh, system from, that looks at the Scopus database. So it's really the same idea. Journals are categorized by um, major themes and then those specific subject categories, just like JCR. And you'll see here that they use the quartiles as well. So for JAMA surgery in Simago, you can see that it is within Q1 for the most recent year, but it's been Q1 for a very long time. So this is just an alternative way to um, measure those journal metrics. And as I keep talking about journal metrics, I know it's important to researchers at MCW 
Um, I know it's in our strategic um, plan for 2025 is to publish in upper quartile journals. And again, I get questions like this probably every week from researchers wondering, you know, maybe what does that mean or what's included? Well, what's great is every year, um, MCW libraries, we pull the list of MCW's top tier journals and we put that into the FCD. So the FCD, I'm sure you all know what it is, but the Faculty Collaboration Database. So anyone that's a faculty member um, or a faculty designee can log in and get this report. And it is a list of over 4,000 journals that we um, consider top tier. That's going to be everything that is in Q1 in JCR. But we're also a little bit more lenient with that because journal rankings can be pretty volatile. So it can a journal can drop off you know, one year to the next, but that we want to see these journals sticking around a little bit longer for our faculty members so that um, we're not seeing that volatility in our own publishing. So that's why our list is a little more generous than just the JCR. So with our top tier journal list, it's actually anything that's been in Q1 in the last five years. So after five years, if it hasn't come back up to Q1, it will drop off. But that accounts for that change in um, publishing. So just something to keep in mind if you are looking to publish in something that maybe your department is saying you have, need to publish in top tier journals, we want people publishing in upper quartiles. Um, this is a great list to do that because it's the one that MCW Office of Research um, uses for their publication reports. And I know I mentioned open access a little bit already. We do actually have a recorded webinar on open access publishing. So if anything I say here sounds interesting, you wanna know more, that is on our YouTube channel. Otherwise, feel free to reach out and we can chat about your options for open access publishing. But open access is a publishing model for scholarly communication that makes research available to readers at no cost. So this is actually really great because it provides free, immediate, and equitable access to all of that journal content. It promotes collaboration and scientific advancement. And you can also even see higher citation rates and research impact when publishing within an open access journal. So there are a few options. I know I talked about hybrid journals, um, but I just wanted to go over the three types of open access publishing that you might run into, just so you know what the terminology is if you come across one. So if we have the gold route, um, you would be publishing in an open access journal and you would probably pay an APC, so an article processing charge, um, if it's required. I know in the DOAJ, we did see some journals that weren't charging any APCs, but a majority of them do, or do require an APC um, to publish. That can vary between you know, small amounts, maybe 100, 500, not that that's small, but then there are some, like we saw, that are 3,000. Um, I saw one even that was 11,000. <laughs> so um, they can go up, but I would say most, um, are, most of them are probably below $2,000. Um, a good option if you are looking to publish in an open access journal, if you are grant funded, a lot of the times um, funders will help fund that APC so that you are publishing in an open access journal. I know some departments at MCW do have a budget line for APCs. And then also something that I know a colleague of mine they um, public, wanted to publish in JAMA. Um, it wasn't accepted, but the person suggested they publish in JAMA Network Open. That is their open access um, journal. However, she said, you know, I'm self-funded. I don't have money to pay for an APC. The editor told them to just reach out to the journal itself, so the journal editors, 
and see what if they can work with you on that. They were able to waive her cost because she was a self public or self funded author, and they really wanted her article within their journal. So that's always an option too. It doesn't hurt to reach out um, and ask if they can work with you on those APCs. <clears throat> then there's the green route. So this would be publishing in a traditional subscription based journal. However, you as the author might self archive your article, maybe in an open repository. And from there, you would have immediate or delayed open access. Then finally, we have that hybrid route. So that I mentioned before, I think Cell was on there. Um, but so something like that journal has some articles that are subscription based and some that are open access. And like I said, in that example, if you want to publish within that journal as an open access um, article, you might have to pay, probably have to pay that APC fee. And again, something like Cell is going to be very high uh, because it does provide that immediate open access. So in the library world, um, librarians don't really love the hybrid model just because those journals are actually getting money from libraries and institutions for subscriptions, but then they're also getting money for from the authors themselves. Um, so that really they're getting money from both sides and not really um, providing the same level of uh, access. So those are just a few things I wanted to mention about um, open access publishing in general. Again, we do have a webinar that is uh, on open access on our YouTube channel. But along with open access comes predatory publishing. So predatory journals are pseudo academic journals that exist for the sole purpose of collecting fees from authors. Um, they are um, a concern because they are sometimes difficult to identify. They pose as high quality open access journals, but really fail to deliver meaningful um, editorial and peer review. So I, this might seem obvious, but I do want to go over some of the things to look out for for predatory publishers, just because I have um, had people fall for um, some of these journals semi recently. So I think it's just good to go over what to look out for. So in general, predatory publishers are going to have that pay to publish model. However, they're going to be low quality journals, pretty much unvetted and not peer reviewed. And along with that comes several harms of publishing within them. So you won't have any potential to republish your article in a better quality journal. You might be in non-compliance with your funders. And then finally, your reputation. If you are found to be publishing predatory journals, it can affect your ability and even your institution's ability to get funding in the future. So it's really important to be careful when um, publishing. So a few things to look out for. Um, journal title. It's going to sound really similar to a reputable publication. But the content of the articles might not really seem to match the title of the journal or its scope. Um, it also might contain words that make the publication seem prestigious, so global, international, universal. But again, it's not going to match the editorial board um, members' locations. Um, and then just a side note of one I had someone ask me about. Um, they thought they had found a predatory publisher, wanted to make sure. So I did some digging and found out that, so through a lot of digging, because the website seemed very legitimate, um, it was great until I went down and looked up their contact address, and it was an apartment complex in the Houston area. So that was the big red flag right there, um, that it was a predatory publisher. Indexing. So the journal will probably not be indexed in a reputable database such as Web of Science, Medline, PsycInfo. Um, and maybe it, you won't even find it in the directory of open access journals. 
And again, like I've mentioned before, the DOAJ is a great place to go to make sure you're looking at reputable open access journal options. And with indexing, you can go to PubMed and look at their index and make sure that a journal is being indexed by um, Medline itself. Fees. So exact fees aren't going to be openly dis disclosed. They may not be easy to locate. The journal may require a submission fee. So payable, whether you're being accepted or not. The APCs are probably going to be low. So many legitimate open access publishers do charge fees, but really low fees can be a warning sign. Not always so. Editorial board. So the editors you might not be familiar with. They don't appear to be people who actually work in the field. They're not easy to uh, find their contact information. Maybe the editorial board is really small or it hasn't even been established yet. And the website. So again, this can be tricky, but some of these websites will contain misspellings or errors. They might look unprofessional or have ads. So just things that may look a little flashy. Um, peer review. So rapid peer review is going to be promised. It's going to seem too good to be true. Um, the peer review policies might not even be stated. And does the journal have a retraction policy or not? And metrics, this is a big one as well. Um, the journal will probably promote an impact factor that can't be found or verified within the JCR. They actually might even promote the index Copernicus value rather than something like impact factor or the Simago journal rank. Um, that's really uh, something to look out for because it has been um, shown to be misleading. And finally, the journal doesn't have an ISSN number. That is a big red flag. But as you're going through that you know, process of determining whether a journal you want to submit to is reputable, there are resources out there, again, to help you. So the DOAJ, again, is great. There is something called Beal's List. So this was created by Jeffrey Beal, a librarian who first brought attention to the problem of predatory publishers and created a blacklist um, based on his own criteria. So that is out there. You can just Google Beal's List. Um, he stopped um, updating his list, but someone else did take it over and there is an update as well. That is also where I have found a predatory publisher as well. Um, so I know um, it does help when determining that. And then finally, think, check, submit. This is great. Um, it's a checklist tool that will help you um, discover what you need to know when assessing that, whether or not that publisher is reputable, um, suitable for your research. Um, so that's always a tool that is available to you. And then a few other things that might be helpful. So if we look at persistent author identifiers, if you're publishing under a common name, um, it is hard to distinguish you know, who's who when you're maybe looking to look at your own research impact. Um, that's where ORCID comes in. Um, ORCID is an acronym for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. So ORCID IDs are now um, an essential part of the metadata associated with research outputs. And they do eliminate some of that burden for you as a researcher. So unlike other researcher IDs, um, the ORCID ID is universal. It's not tied to an institution or a database. It can follow you wherever you go. Um, so make sure to include that ORCID ID when you're submitting publications, applying for grants, and in any research and um, workflow just to ensure that you're getting credit for your work. Um, you'll see this a lot uh, being included in PubMed now. Um, it's really great to connect to maybe your data as well, just keeping that connection between the publication and your research data. It's a really great, great way to um, distinguish yourself because I know I've done um, a research metric um, project for 
MCW. And there are authors within the institution itself that do have similar first and last names. And it is hard to distinguish which one is which. So the author themselves, if they're looking to clean up their FCD profile, it is a lot of work to go through and you know, go through 200 articles that might be yours or might be a colleague from a different department. And you have to go through each one because we can't distinguish it anymore um, based on just your author name. Um, here's a, just a, a screenshot of the ORCID website. It is really quick to set up an ORCID ID. Honestly, I think when I did it, it was maybe 30 seconds. So it's really easy to set up and just have ready. And a side note, um, if you are doing anything with the NIH um, and you have to write a data management plan, there is a way to connect your ORCID ID through the DMP tool as well. Again, like I said, making sure you're connecting your data to your publication itself. And I just mentioned the NIH. So you may be familiar with this, but if you do receive any NIH funding, um, they do require that you make your peer-reviewed manuscripts freely available within PubMed Central within a year of publication. So sometimes that is automatically done by the journal. Sometimes that lies with you as the author. And I have walked a couple authors through that process of um, making sure that their articles are in compliance with this policy. So always feel free to reach out. However, I will note that the US, so the White House um, Office of Science and Technology, they re released a memo last um, summer that recommended that all federal agencies update their public access policies by the end of 2025. And this would actually remove the 12 month embargo period so that your publication, your federally funded publication and data would be immediately available. So it's just something to keep in mind um, going forward. It is not in place right now, um, but just something to think about for the future. And we do have a libguide on the NIH public access policy um, if you are looking for more information. However, if you ever come across it and you need help walking through that process, always feel free to reach out. And then I have just listed our scholarly communication libguide. This has um, guides on pretty much everything I've discussed today. Um, we do have a libguide on publishing itself. So if you ever have questions on where to publish and you want to re reference back, we do have a libguide specifically on that. We also have information on um, the NIH public access policy, um, data management, things that also might go along with publishing. Um, so just keep that in mind as well if you're looking for a helpful reference. But this was all I had to go through today. I'd be happy to answer questions. Did you want to see any of those tools again? I'd be happy to um, show you more about how those work. Or if you have questions about um, journal metrics in general, if you want to see where the um, top tier journal list is on the FCD, I can show you that as well. Oh yes, I can share the slides. I will email you. I'll just email all of you the slides just so you have them. Yeah, you're welcome. And they will have all of those links are active. So that's a little more helpful for you. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Um, can we email you if we come up with any questions later? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes. Um, just look me up in Outlook. It's Ashley Zeidler. Um, yeah, feel free to email me anytime. We can chat via email. We can set up a consultation, anything that would be helpful. Okay, great. Thank you so much. This was great information. You're welcome. All right. Well, if there aren't any questions, I can let you have some time back in your day.
but just watch out for me email. I'll share those slides with you and a recording of this will be on our YouTube channel if you want to revisit any of this um, information. And like I said, feel free to email me anytime if you have questions or want to set up a consultation. Um, I'm always happy to um, chat and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you all. Um, have a great day.